Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 24 of Mind Matters. We are really happy to welcome all of you who are new listeners to our show. Today, we're going to be talking about the importance of helping our high ability and twice exceptional kids stay tenacious and resilient with Emily Mofield and Megan Parker Peters of Lipscomb University. Stay with us. If we haven't connected yet on social media, don't forget that social media is a great way to stay in touch and learn about what's going on with us at Mind Matters. We are on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, and on Facebook and Instagram, we are Mind Matters Podcast. You can find links and resources um, and a contact page at our website, which is mindmatterspodcast.com. Coming up, the authors of Teaching Tenacity, Resilience, and a Drive for Excellence, Emily Mofield and Megan Parker Peters. Stay tuned. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to Patreon.com slash Mind Matters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. I'm Emily Mofield, and I'm an assistant professor at Lipscomb University. This is Megan Parker Peters. I'm an associate professor and the director of teacher education and assessment at Lipscomb University, the co authors of Teaching Tenacity, Resilience, and a Drive for Excellence. So, we're talking today about tenacity and resilience. Can you tell us what those terms mean and how you use them uh, within the context of your book? So tenacity, it's, uh, it's kind of a prettier word for grit. And what we really mean by that is sticking to something. You keep on keeping on. And we see tenacity is highly related to student interest. And so we don't think kids are going to be gritty or tenacious at taking standardized tests. Um, we use this in the context of um, having tenacity towards a long-term interest or passion. And we're also not talking about self-control here. Um, We're talking about a way to help kids understand who they are, to understand their identity more completely, and then they're going to be tenacious towards pursuing something that's meaningful to them. And then when we talk about resilience, um, that's very much related to tenacity, but it's being able to overcome those obstacles that come in your way. Um, so many of our gifted students, they, they think um, everything should just be easy sailing. They're smart. And then when they encounter a setback, it's often the end of the world for them. So we mean really resilience as you keep on keeping on because you're able to overcome those obstacles. So I think a lot of times tenacity and grit aren't necessarily associated with emotion, but actually more of an ability to ignore that emotion and kind of bear down. But tenacity does involve harnessing emotions, doesn't it? Yes. A lot has been said about mindset and getting kids to embrace challenges and learn from their mistakes, but we're kind of missing out on this idea that, hey, emotions are involved here. Um, For our book, we are specifically, we used um, Baron's model of emotional intelligence because it emphasized cognitive connections and the developmental nature of emotional intelligence, which is pretty different from a lot of um, what we see out there right now that talks about tenacity and even emotions and grit. Um, But our ability to understand how our emotions and those of others and how we manage and control our emotions, it's at the forefront of Baron's model. And, And he really talks about 
how when we use these emotions to think about how our thoughts and emotions influence each other, they can both be developed. So you don't have to be born with this high level of tenacity or resilience or all of the other SEL areas that we, we discuss in our book, but these areas can be nurtured and strengthened. And we want to show students how their emotions, they can actually influence the thoughts, the cognitions, and they can learn to be aware of and prepare for um, these patterns to, to support them to be more productive with their behaviors and actions instead of allowing these emotions to take away from their goals and their progress towards their goals. So tell me about why this topic is specifically important to the development of high ability learners. What makes it a little bit different in terms of the perspective we need to take? Well, the way we see it is uh, many of our gifted learners, they don't have opportunities to develop these skills until they actually do something hard. And too often, they don't get those opportunities. So here's what happens. They, They keep getting reinforced with praise for doing well on easy things. They get A's on busy work. Um, They develop these identities based on what others see as valuable, often good grades, and they feel good about their success, Um, but their success was not really due to doing something hard. And so they learn this behavior and this behavior is rewarded. They're able to do things quickly and right. And then all of a sudden when they feel effort, it's hard and it's uncomfortable. And another reason, uh, there's this talent development model in gifted education. And in that model, um, as, as kids progress to these higher levels of talent, like to more competitive situations where they are going to grow up and be experts in their field, um, as they keep growing and growing, these psychosocial skills become more and more important. So it's beyond just developing a growth mindset. It's things like, well, how do we handle highly competitive environments? How can I advocate for an innovative, creative idea in the face of extreme criticism? What are some of the flaws that you see in our educational system that kind of feed into this? This is very much related to curriculum um, and lack of challenging curriculum. So um, often in middle school, and I was a middle school English language arts teacher for gifted students for 10 years, Um, middle school, two things can happen. Um, It could just be full of review work. And this is just going to continue to reinforce this idea, hey, easy means smart. And, you know, I keep getting reinforced for for this and this feels good. And so this means that later um, they're not used to working hard. Right. So when gifted students do encounter challenges, many times it, it can be painful. So they haven't had to deal with Um, this pain or this experience to a large degree in the past because things may have come really easily to them. They haven't had to push through painful moments when something is new or something is challenging because they've never had that experience in the classroom. So when a, a high ability student senses or thinks that he or she might not be the best right away or might not master something new right away, they might choose to avoid Um, that skill or that class or that extracurricular activity because they fear that they might have to experience pain. So in our book, we have this theme. It's called leaning in and pushing through. So students, they have to deal with a temporary pain of when they try something new or when they decide to really engage in in a challenging situation in order to push through and get to the other side, which includes getting through that challenge, having greater mastery and even growing. So so we teach that this temporary pain, it's kind of like delayed gratification. So it's dealing with the stress and emotion of, of the experience. So we may also see this avoidance displayed in, in even self-handicapping behaviors. So they may put off doing projects or even homework that could be challenging or they perceive as challenging. I've talked about this with families quite a bit when I work with kids. It's almost like these high ability kids when they're little, they kind of learn by osmosis. They just learn without even being taught. And so then they don't ever learn how to learn. I don't know, you know, or how to how to persevere through those things. And that's kind of what it sounds like you're talking about. And it's really a blow to their self-esteem. Right. So 
we are all about helping kids understand what's meaningful to them and chase that passionately instead of avoiding things that would threaten their identity. And so it's really getting to the heart of what school should be about anyways, a love of learning instead of a fear of failure. Do you think that there are things that parents or teachers might be doing inadvertently that are actually hurting their efforts to teach this type of a mindset to kids? Well, there really are some simple things. First, I mean, very simply, watching what we say and model, and and it's said often, but our words matter. So getting away from person-centered praise. Um, We need to focus on praise and even criticism as things that are more actionable because we are going to make mistakes and students need the method, need to know the methods, the strategies, the choices, the efforts, they do matter. And without actionable feedback, the student assumes they are no longer the smart, genius, whatever, when they don't get that praise. So we're all capable of change and improvement, and this should be emphasized. You mentioned the term person-centered praise. So can you give me an example of what that might sound like versus something different? So person-centered phrase is going to get to concrete characteristics. So you're so smart. You're the genius. Um, things like that. But it, it, the, these aren't supportive of continued growth because it's saying you're a genius. And if you make that mistake, I might internalize, well, maybe I'm not such a genius after all. And so then the, the flip side of that would be focusing on things that students can change. So I can change the method that I use to work this problem. I can change the strategy, the choices, the effort, the time that I put into something. Another big part of our research has recently been about, well, what do gifted students think about their intelligence? What do gifted kids have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? And there's been so much about mindset out there. I'm sure people are almost tired of talking about it. But we also want to emphasize how important it is to talk to kids about being gifted. Because there's a lot that's been said out there like, oh, we better be careful about telling the kids they're gifted because it might cause them to develop these fixed mindsets. And there's there's just been a lot about that. And I think a lot of parents and teachers might even be afraid to tell their children they're smart or that they're gifted. And we do need to be a bit cautious about that. But if we're open with the kids and and help them understand that it's not just their intelligence that can change, but their giftedness is malleable, that yes, you were born, you, you have high ability, but it can also grow and change. You do have some control over your talent. And that's a big part of what we're trying to emphasize, that when we talk about mindset and we talk about this process praise and person-centered praise, we don't have to be too afraid of skirting around this issue of helping a child understand their giftedness. I know what you mean when people talk about if you tell them that they're gifted, then that's going to cause problems later on down the line. But maybe it's not so much about the labeling, but how we handle that label. What are we doing to support them? What are we doing to provide them with challenge? And what are we, you know... Is that label the only thing they're learning about, how their mind is wired? Or are we providing other opportunities to understand that a a label is fluid? It's not a life sentence (laughs) one way or the other. It's not a curse. It's not a life sentence. It helps you understand who you are. And when you understand who you are, you can take next steps to Mm -hmm. develop who you are. Do you guys notice at any certain ages that um, either a lack of tenacity and resilience or, you know, more of a fixed mindset, like certain developmental stages where that becomes more of a problem or certain ages where they kind of maybe grow out of it or mature out of it? As I've mentioned before, I think middle school is the time where where if they do start seeing some more challenging things or it might be later in high school, they're like, oh, my goodness, I really might not be gifted. For gifted individuals regardless of the age, it could be a quiet struggle, but it could also be visible. Um, So these could be frustrated students because they may have a lack of understanding about why they can't do something that they feel they should be able to do better. Um, They they understand that they have strong abilities, but it may just not be happening. And in our book, we discuss how to build those skills that are needed to move from that level of frustration to a level of greater success. We see underachievement being like in two forms. There's the overt underachievement where it's obvious they have C's or D's or even F's. They're just not turning in their work. They're just organized and they're not doing what a teacher asks. 
And then there is the covert underachiever. And these are harder to identify. Um, they, they're, they're the ones who are going to avoid the AP courses. They're going to avoid the honors courses because they're afraid they're going to make a B. So with these covert underachievers, they're missing out on opportunities to really grow and learn. Yeah, which which kind of brings me, you know, to the topic of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that closely ties in with this topic. Can you talk a little bit about how perfectionism ties in with um, resilience and tenacity? Yeah, it's not a secret. Gifted students often exhibit perfectionism. They perform at this very high level and they expect performance at a high level compared to most most others, including their peers. But, but we're not promoting perfectionism in, in our book or in our work, but we are promoting striving towards appropriately challenging goals. And for gifted students, these goals will be higher, but we don't want students to measure their self-worth based on a goal of perfection. So instead, we want to have students um, get away from that all or nothing thinking and the should statements and these other harmful things thoughts that haunt the minds of many gifted students. And instead, we want to teach healthy goal setting. And that means high goals, but healthy goal setting and goal achieving strategies so that they can experience these more positive growth supporting thoughts that are going to support them to get to those high level goals. Perfectionism is really about avoidance. Um, Sometimes it's been said perfectionism is a shield for shame. You know, you're doing everything to avoid the feeling of shame. But tenacity or this drive for excellence is, is more about pursuing something for the motivation to do well. You mentioned the word shame. And anytime I think of shame, I also think about the concept of vulnerability. And I can see how there's a level of vulnerability that's necessary to have that growth mindset because you have to be able to admit that you need help. Yes. So with with tenacity and grit and all of these things, it, there has to be an element really of, of humility and understanding that, okay, I'm not perfect. And in order for me to grow, I need to seek feedback. I need to seek out ways that to continually improve. What are some of the steps that parents and teachers can really take some some actionable things that they can do to help their kids develop those skills of tenacity and resilience? Well, Megan's brought up um, before a little bit about the importance of that process praise. And um, and I'll pick up from there. Um, one of our favorites is to use this strategy called WHOOP. And it's something that was developed by Gabriel Oitingen. And um, first, think about the W. What's your wish? What is it that you really, really want? And then think very positively about that. So then think about the O, the outcome visualize the positive, wonderful things that are going to happen when you actually achieve this goal. A lot of times when we teach kids goal setting strategies, we stop there. We tell them to um, have these big dreams, have these goals, and we tell them to make steps towards those goals, like the SMART goals everyone knows about. But some some research shows that if we just teach kids to think positively, then actually they will be less motivated to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. So the next thing to do is to then provide a contrast in their thinking where we now teach them to think a little bit like a pessimist and to think of the second O, the obstacles that would actually get in the way. And this, I think, is the key to developing resilience. Um, These could be things inside myself or, or in my environment, it, the obstacle might be that I procrastinate. The obstacle might be that I'm afraid I'm not going to do well. Or the obstacle might be that, hey, when I come home, I'm just, I'm just too tired to do this. Yeah. So when the kids can identify the obstacle, the next step is to have a plan to truly develop an if-then plan so that you can go back, your brain can go back to thinking of this positive outcome and wish. And why this works, I think, is so fascinating is because there is this contrast between the positive and the negative. And when your brain thought, thinks about that negative obstacle that gets in the way, your 
it kind of provides this this angst, like, oh, I want to go back to that positive feeling. And so you're more motivated to implement your if-then plan. Mm -hmm. So let's say a student, um, they're working on um, practicing some instrument, and they want to be able to play this song very well. So that's their wish. They want to be able to perform a song well. But the obstacle is I don't practice hard because I get frustrated. So the plan is... If I get frustrated, I will take it slowly and practice one note at a time. So um, I love this strategy. Again, this is by Gabrielle Oetingen's work, and I feel like it is like the key to teaching tenacity. So as we really try to help our kids become more tenacious and resilient, especially if that's not their natural instinct, I'm imagining there might be some negative byproducts like anxiety and stress. How do you suggest that a parent could help their child, you know, to deal with those feelings? We can help them think about what can they control and what can they not control. So helping them develop plans for possible obstacles sounds like it's common sense, but really a plan will often really alleviate a lot of anxiety. And then with helping them deal with stress, when they feel stress in their bodies, it's it's there for a reason. There's a physiological response. So helping kids be aware, okay, this is how my body is feeling. This is preparing me to do something big. But is what I'm being prepared to do, is it is preparing me for a threat or a challenge? And if it's a challenge, then I'm going to use this energy to go for it. And it, it, and it can be channeled in a more positive way. But again, this comes in helping kids become self-aware. Tell me about how all of this ties into the needs of TUI or twice exceptional learners. As a psychologist, when I work with families of twice exceptional learners, I always emphasize the importance of really capitalizing on these students' strengths. So a lot of times, twice exceptional learners, as we know through the challenges and identification, they're identified for for their other exceptionality, maybe prior to or instead of their giftedness. But these students need self-awareness of their great strengths in addition to knowing where they need supports. Um, So they're gifted too, and we need to celebrate this and help them to use their strengths to support their development in their other area of exceptionality. This could involve creating goals and meeting goals um, in the area of weakness and areas of strengths, um, especially when we can fuel these through their known strengths. So more specifically, we could teach strategies to support goal setting, such as one called PACT that's in our book. Um, So we describe the PACT strategy. It's it's an acronym for problem, alternatives, consequences, and then try one. So maybe students having difficulty determining a topic for a project, they cannot narrow it down. So the next step is to organize some alternatives. So some ideas of how they might solve this problem. They could use some Google searches. They could call a friend for advice. Maybe even make a concept map of potential ideas. It's three possible ways they could um, start to approach this problem. But then they should also, as the C in PACT, consider the consequences of, of each of these viable alternatives. So Google, that it might give you a lot of ideas, but it may also lead to some distractions or take you down a rabbit hole or to tangential ideas. Um, thinking about your friend and advice, they may be able to give you new perspectives that you hadn't thought about, as long as you stay on task. Um, and then thinking about a concept map, this will be limited to your ideas, so you won't really get new perspectives, but it will stay focused. So thinking about these, these positives and negatives for each of the potential alternatives is, is part of that consequences part of PACT. But then you end the PACT strategy, or at least the first cycle, by trying um, one of these alternatives. So maybe first trying the concept map. And if it doesn't turn out as, as the student intended, then they have some other options from those alternatives to try until their original goal, their original problem is solved or met. So it can be recycled um, until the student finds a viable solution for their problem. Yeah. 
part of our curriculum also includes developing good communication styles, like with interpersonal skills. And um, we think it's really important to, to develop appropriate assertive communication skills. So sometimes kids need to be taught appropriate ways to advocate for themselves. Yeah. And when we don't teach them appropriate ways to, to do that, they're going to revert to maybe even passive aggressive behaviors where they can go, come home and say, my teacher doesn't like me, or they can even manipulate a situation. You know, many teenagers do that. But when we can teach them to communicate, like, I sometimes feel frustrated because already know how to do this. Would I be able to do something else that shows what I know? And we teach them to ask for things in, in a respectful way that could really help them. So this is a process and getting to a place where a child has more of that tenacity, more vision, more grit. That's something that parents and teachers and counselors might need to really consider as a longer term goal for these kids. I'm thinking though, because every child is different, um, that such a change may involve a lot of emotional reframing. They really need to know that they have that control. It's about their perceptions of, of situations, the value that they perceive in a task, the impacts even that they perceive that stem from their emotions. And we want students to know that they have control. Emotions don't just happen to us. There's a connection, and we can acknowledge that, understand it, and then learn how we can manage it. And the same holds true for many of the other concepts that we share in our book, such as perfectionism. So not making a perfect score doesn't mean that you're a failure or that you're stupid, but it is important to consider the emotion and the impact that comes when you don't make the grade that you want. So that when you feel that way, you can begin to take control of the thinking and that's further going to put you in the right place to take action and um, push us forward with our goals. When I was in the classroom, I was working with kids who wanted to give up. You know, in my class, which I taught the gifted class, it was it was hard for them sometimes for the first time. And I would see I would I'd see so many of my students deal with perfectionism and I really wanted to know how to help them. And so curriculum really matters what you do, developing advanced uh, learning experiences can really um, nip some of this in, in the bud to begin with. And um, and to also acknowledge that their social emotional learning is very, very important. Emotions can catalyze our achievement or paralyze our achievement. And we need to just bring that to the forefront of how we plan our lessons. This is all about helping kids chase meaning instead of avoiding things that they're afraid to do. So when we can expose opportunities where kids are exploring their interests, that is so powerful. And when they find what they're interested in and what they're passionate about, that's going to bring so much meaning to their lives. That's how you build tenacity and resilience. Emily Mofield and Megan Parker-Peters, authors of Teaching Tenacity, Resilience, and a Drive for Excellence. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks for having us today. I'll have my thoughts and we'll hear from the panel of experts in a minute. To reach the Mind Matters podcast, go to our website, mindmatterspodcast.com and click on contact. Follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast, or you can reach our YouTube channel through our website. To know that basically I'm going to be able to get through it somehow and that it's going to turn out well in the end. It's when you can keep going and not quit, even if you really want to quit and it's hard to not quit. Working hard and knowing that like when things get tough, if you like know what you want and you kind of like persevere through the hard times, like you can reach your goals. Like times are hard, but there's always going to be some, da some way down the road, like a good outcome. I think it was like in middle school, like classes started getting hard for me for the first time. I got like my first B's in a class. Yeah, it was like the first time something I actually thought of something as difficult. Oh, I was in seventh grade and I was in science class and the teacher, I don't know, I just, I didn't, her teaching style was strange and I didn't really understand anything she was saying. And my grades were not great that year. It's like a shock almost. 
And then I realized like, you know, there's a, it's totally different. There's like a different world out there than it was, you know, a year ago or a couple months ago. I guess just all my classes were pretty hard, but one of my teachers, I talked to her about it and I talked about how, like I told her like, I don't like school cause it's like getting hard and like boring. But she told me like, you can't expect things to always come to you. You have to work hard through stuff. And that like got me a long way. So I started like working harder in classes. And like, I started getting better results. Oh, at that point, I just decided that that meant I was a failure. And I was like, looks like this is just the rest of my life now. I'm gonna get a C in middle school science. If you push through, it's gonna be a lot easier in other times where it's gonna be hard that you'll be able to get through it or whatever. Yeah, then I talked to like a couple of my teachers and I guess I stepped it up and I like saw, well, if I do try, like I can get through these classes and I can like actually pass with like good grades. I tried to do better. I studied for tests, which is something that I don't do normally. And I tried to just absorb information better any way I could. There's other people that are getting through the same thing that you have or already have gotten through it that if it's really that bad, you can talk to. I remember a client, he was a gifted kiddo and he was also a skilled baseball player. His parents noted that he really loved the sport and he wanted to be a pitcher, but he was really resistant to any of the drills that his coach suggested or his dad's offers to practice with him. I think he was in maybe fourth or fifth grade at the time, um, and as we processed through this, I realized what the disconnect was. When he was pitching, he did well. His team was winning, he was already one of the best on his team, and he just kind of figured that he was as good as he could get. His skill had developed naturally over the years without any real effort. He didn't have any awareness of what types of other more competitive teams might be out there. And he assumed that he would continue to be the best because, well, he always had been. His parents also noticed that that same lackadaisical effort appeared at school too. As adults, we knew what the future would hold for him. So this is where we really have to come in. We're parents, educators, counselors, and we have to provide opportunities for kids to struggle. They have to know what it feels like to fail. When we don't provide challenge at school and we let these bright kids fly under the radar, they develop these internal monologues that equate being smart with something being easy. I was talking to a parent and client recently, and this gifted high schooler said, Why give 150% when 75% will do just fine? I laughed, but it reminded me that GT kiddos are aware of low expectations, and many, or maybe most of them, won't naturally challenge themselves if they aren't pushed. It's our job to push them and to teach them the skills of how to persevere when things aren't easy. Because it's better to push these kiddos now when they're young, because we are still here to be their safety net. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. Subscribe, follow us, and we'll see you on the next Mind Matters. We're gonna be this is We're gonna be we won't out of this fight. Have no regrets. Just hold your breath and then you'll be Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. You can find us on Apple iTunes, Google Play, or anywhere podcasts are available. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a positive review. We're also on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, and on Facebook and Instagram, it's Mind Matters Podcast. The executive producer of Mind Matters is me, Dave Morris. And on behalf of everyone here, thanks for listening. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.